Okay. Well, thanks everyone for um, coming back to the second um, to last talk of the summer school. We have Professor Balance um, for this talk of the day. That's gonna be again on spin liquids. Um, Professor Balance, thanks for joining us from California. I'll hand this over to you. Thanks, Galara. Let me share my screen. Oh, uh, maybe it says host disabled. Attendee screen sharing. Here we go. Now it's allowed. Uh, so are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thanks for coming back. Um, it's been a week since uh, I talked to you last about spin liquids and uh, I want to pick up um, more or less where I left off. I'm going to repeat a little bit um, since it has been a week. Uh, so uh, last time I talked uh, largely about theory, um, about uh, sort of fundamental properties of spin liquids and how you should think about them, um, how we might approach them um, in terms of their wave functions, different ways of representing their properties, um, why we'd be interested in them. Um, and I began to sort of do uh, some kind of a review of some of the um, main experimental systems that uh, uh, researchers have used to look for these, um, have and continue to look at them. Uh, we talked about this uh, Kagame lattice and I spent a little bit of time talking about uh, Herbert Smithite. Um, uh, and uh, I, I did talk a little bit about uh, Kataev materials, um, but I want to pick up, I'm going to repeat a little bit what I said there um, and then talk about these uh, other examples uh, and try to uh, go into a little bit of detail. Um, uh, these these uh, last three examples are somewhat notable um, and not only because they've uh, received a lot of attention in the field, but also because in each case there's something that might be considered a smoking gun signature. So one of the points I tried to make in the, in the previous lecture was that uh, quantum spin liquid states are really quite varied. They're as variable as different conducting states uh, of quantum materials. Um, and so there isn't just one single uh, way to identify one. Um, you really need to understand uh, specific physics associated with one type of spin liquid to, to know how to identify it. Um, and while the Kagame is kind of perhaps the most storied system in which uh, people have expected quantum spin liquids, um, that in that case, there is somewhat less of a, of a clear uh, smoking gun signature. Um, but but uh, for the remaining three, I think um, at least theoretically, we have good ideas about what to look for. Um, and so I, I want to spend a little bit of time on that. Um, so, um, uh, so let me come back to these Kataev systems. So this is uh, really the interest in this uh, stems theoretically from uh, Alexei Kataev's brilliant work, uh, where he uh, wrote down this Kataev honeycomb model. As I mentioned before, this is a, a funny model of uh, spin one half spins on the honeycomb lattice. Um, in which the spins along the three different bond directions, we can label these directions X, Y, and Z, um, uh, involve uh, interactions just between those components of the spin. So along this bond, we have a uh, SX, SX interaction. Along this bond, we have an SY, SY interaction. Along this bond, SZ, SZ. And what uh, Kataev showed was it's possible actually to solve this Hamiltonian, in fact, with arbitrary values of these exchange constants called K here, I guess, for Kataev. Um, uh, uh, exactly using uh, an exact version of this parton construction. Uh, it's quite similar to the Goodsfeller construction I talked about before, uh, although he phrased it in terms of uh, what are called Majorana fermions. So these are uh, uh, self, uh, self-conjugate, self they're Hermitian fermion operators, um, and there are four of them. Uh, here one, we denote them with an X, Y, or Z, or no uh, superscript. Um, and basically what Kataev showed is that uh, by inserting this in here and using advantage, taking advantage of um, conserved quantities in this Hamiltonian, you could actually reduce it 
to a quadratic Hamiltonian for this one uh, unlettered uh, flavor of Majorana fermions. And these, these just hop around on the lattice, and so they disperse, they form a highly dispersive uh, band of uh, fractional fermion excitations. Uh, so this is quite different from Anderson's paradigm here um, of uh, the RVB state in that this Hamiltonian is very, very far from SE2 symmetric. And so it's not really correct to think about the ground state of this uh, system as a, as a superposition of singlets. Um, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not a spin eigenstate really in any way. Um, uh, what it has, uh, however, is it has this essential element of entanglement and of fractionalization. Um, the uh, most obvious fractional excitation is the one we just talked about, this Majorana fermion, uh, which is uh, highly delocalized. Um, it can move around the lattice uh, very fast. Uh, but in fact, the, uh, there's another set of excitations, uh, which are sometimes called fluxes, um, each one of the plaquettes in the honeycomb lattice could be occupied or not by a flux. So it's a sort of an Ising-like excitation in that sense. And these, in Kataya's model, they're completely localized. They, they, they cost a certain small amount of energy to create, uh, but they never move. Um, uh, on the other hand, the Majorana fermions are gapless. They're dispersed down to zero energy with a Dirac-like dispersion, just like in graphene. But uh, the overall bandwidth is very wide, much wider than the gap to these flux excitations. Um, uh, Kitayev's original interest was uh, actually not in that gapless phase, but in getting using it to get to something else. What he showed was that if you uh, perturb this, uh, his spin liquid state with a magnetic field applied uh, in such a way that it couples to all three components of the spins, um, uh, it induces uh, uh, a gap for these Majorana fermions that turns out to be some sort of higher order effect. It occurs at third order in the magnetic field. Um, and that gap uh, effectively uh, uh, creates uh, topological bands for these Majorana fermions, um, something like a churn band. Um, and because of that, uh, it's a bit like the quantum Hall effect. In fact, the Kataev's Majorana model is, is really a, a kind of a real valued version of Haldane's uh, Haldane's model for the uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect. Um, and like it, it, it supports a chiral Majorana edge mode. Um, uh, so the low energy Hamiltonian below the gap uh, just consists of states that uh, disperse at the edge and they're linearly dispersing. Uh, so this is just a real space way of writing that there's a mode here whose energy uh, is uh, some velocity V uh, times the uh, momentum K. Uh, of the particle at the edge. Um, yeah, once again, I'm having issues with the windows blocking all my screen. There we go. Um, so how do you detect this edge state? Um, the edge state uh, leads to a very clear signature. This is sort of the smoking gun signature of Kataev's non-abelian spin liquid. Um, uh, well, uh, a chiral edge state, we naturally associate that with some sort of quantum Hall effect. This is a neutral system, so there is certainly no uh, Hall conductivity, sigma xy, like sigma xx, they're all just zero, it's an insulator. Um, but we can uh, look instead for a thermal conductivity. Um, so there's a, a, a simple result for a single chiral edge state, which is that the current just depends on the temperature of that edge. Uh, since all the particles at the edge move in one direction, if you just create, excite more particles at higher energy, they're moving to the right, that's a net current. Uh, uh, in, the, in the direction of propagation, I'll call it the right. And it's easy to calculate. Um, you basically add up, so we integrate over all the states occupied by a Fermi distribution uh, 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 determined by their energy. Uh, uh, so this gives the density of particles. It should be multiplied by uh, the velocity to get a current and by the, the, so that's one factor V and times the energy, which is V times Q. And we add up all the states, the majorana -ness of these fermions uh, is that actually the Majorana fermion only exists for positive Q. Um, if we had a Dirac fermion at the edge, like you have in the integer quantum Hall effect, you have states for both positive and negative momenta. Majorana fermion sort of half of a Dirac fermion, so the Q just extends from zero to infinity. Then you just do this integral using the Fermi function at low temperature. It's quadratic in the temperature with a coefficient, uh, which is universal. Um, and I've written here 
in terms of a, a constant C, which is of course just completely determined in this integral, it's, it's equal to a half. Uh, so this turns out to be an example of a very general result uh, uh, for uh, a more general situation in which this 1D edge uh, is governed not necessarily by a Majorana fermion Hamiltonian, but, but that of any uh, chiral conformal field theory uh, with the, such a conformal field theory is uh, its most fundamental parameter is what's called the chiral central charge. Uh, Majorana fermion has sort of the minimal value of that central charge, which is, which is a half. Uh, so one notable feature of a, a Majorana fermion, um, this, uh, this chiral central charge being a half, it's actually different even from uh, what you would get in both the integer and fractional quantum Hall effects. Um, even the fractional quantum Hall edge state uh, has a, a chiral central charge of one, not a half. So the Majorana fermion is in fact, a, in a way, even more fractionalized than the, than the edge states that occur in the fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, it's really uh, ha having a, a non-integer value of the chiral central charge is actually associated with uh, the bulk being a non-abelian state. It means that the quasi-particles in the bulk, uh, these are the fluxes, if you want, um, in the, um, in the uh, Kitaya formulation, uh, they actually have non-abelian statistics. So if you take a single quasi-particle and you move it uh, around another one, the wave function of the whole system actually be, is multiplied, not just by a phase, but by a unitary matrix. Uh, and the uh, the unitary matrix you get when you do multiple uh, uh, windings like this actually depends uh, upon the order in which you do the windings. Um, so that's a, a long-winded way of saying that it's actually very significant that this chiral central charge is a half. Um, so uh, how is this related to a, a Hall effect? Well, um, in the classic way for a for quantum Hall effect, uh, we can think of a rectangular sample where we put a temperature difference across a sample. So we put a temperature T1 on one edge and a temperature T2 on the other. Uh, the idea you should have in mind is that there's a gap in the bulk. So there's no communication between the upper and the lower edge. Um, because the electrons uh, are uh, ballistically propagating in one direction, they can never backscatter. The entire edge uh, is at, at equilibrium with itself. So it's characterized by a single temperature but the two edges being separated don't have to be at equilibrium with one another, so they can be at different temperatures. Uh, so you can see that if there's a different temperature at the top edge and the bottom edge, there'll be a net current flowing in one direction or the other, let's say to the right, if the upper temperature is larger, uh, and that current is in the X direction while the thermal gradient is in the Y direction. So this is a Hall effect. So you can just take the expression I had on the previous slide, subtract the contributions of the current at the upper and lower edge, and if the temperature difference between the top and the bottom is small compared to say the mean temperature, we can linearize this around the mean temperature and you find that the current is linear in the temperature difference uh, of the top and bottom edge. Um, this can be written in terms of a, a thermal Hall conductance, um, which is linear in temperature and has this universal form. Okay, so this, this is a, uh, you know, unlike many uh, sort of predictions you could make for a general many body Hamiltonian, this is a universal prediction um, it's, uh, it's really determined just by this single universal quantity, the, uh, the chiral central charge, provided we have a, a gap state in the bulk, um, an observation of this thermal Hall conductivity is kind of a direct observation of this type of topological, uh, non-abelian topological order uh, of this spin liquid state. Um, so now let me get to experiment. Um, uh, uh, this was, uh, you know, a fascinating theoretical discovery, but it uh, uh, developed a surprising, uh, at least potential connection to reality uh, a number of years later when uh, George Giaculi, uh, Giacchelli and Gignat Kalulin uh, showed surprisingly that um, in strongly spin orbit coupled uh, d-electron systems in which the uh, transition metal ions containing the d-electrons so uh, share ed question. edges of octahedra. Yeah, go ahead. You have a question. Um, so, uh, Sophie Sorn is asking, uh, is this C equals one half related to the Majorana degree of freedom or related to the Vison instead? Um, uh, well, so C equals a half is a, is a characterization of the conformal field theory. Um, so uh, it's, uh, uh, once you know the central charge, in principle, this dictates uh, 
the the full set of possible uh, quasi particles that the that the uh, system can support. So it actually determines uh, the uh, statistics of uh, the Majorana fermion, um, uh, but also the um, what you might call a vison um, in the so this c equals a half is associated with a, a very famous conformal field theory. It's the conformal field theory of the Ising model, um, and there's a correspondence between the uh, quasi particles uh, in this topological phase and the uh, operators uh, or types of correlations in the Ising model. So the uh, there's a fermion, which is sort of famously uh, a way to represent the uh, critical state of uh, of a a two-dimensional Ising model, but on top of that, there is a this is a spin operator for the uh, for the Ising model, and the and the non-abelian particle is related to the spin operator. Uh, you can think of uh, it as in in Kataev solution as being related to the vortex. So, the central charge actually characterizes both of them. Um, although to understand the thermal Hall conductivity, you you don't need to understand the um, uh, the non-abelian vortex. Is, is that a satisfactory answer? Answer your question. Um, I guess there's no way for me to know this. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll just keep going. Uh, feel free to ask something more if, it's, uh, if you need it. Um, uh, so this was kind of a surprising discovery they showed based on uh, basically a quantum chemical. Um, uh, reasoning how how uh, good enough Kanemori rules more or less determine the type of exchange you have between transition metal ions, um, and this this configuration is not so uncommon. It occurs uh, in a number of uh, structures uh, in which uh, iridium, in particular, uh, but also ruthenium um, uh, ions share uh, corner sharing uh, octahedra. And so these materials at first, Guinea, uh, Jekeli, and Kululin identified uh, these uh, 213 iridates, um, and later uh, Young Jun Kim and, and others in Toronto um, identified uh, alpha ruthenium trichloride as another uh, system like this. Um, and there's certainly a lot of uh, evidence for these Kataev type interactions, at least as some component of the exchange in, in all of these Kataev systems. I like this result uh, from years ago from uh, uh, BJ Kim's group, who was in Stuttgart at the time, uh, studying this uh, sodium-2 iridium O3 uh, using um, diffuse magnetic X-ray scattering. Uh, so by looking at the polarization of the scattered X-rays, they could uh, separately measure different uh, components of the spin correlation. So um, they could measure the uh, correlations between the X components of the spins, between the Y components of the spins, and the Z component of the spins. And you can see these correlations peak at different locations in momentum space. So this is intensity versus momentum. And this is a sort of picture of the Brillouin zone here. Um, uh, and so you can, this is direct evidence that there's different type of correlations for different components of the spin, very different from what you'd see in an isotropic Heisenberg-like system and directly connects to the nature of the Kataev interaction. There have been many more experiments showing signs of uh, uh, very strong continuum excitations uh, in these materials. This is some uh, uh, of the data uh, from the Oak Ridge group on uh, alpha ruthenium trichloride, uh, some of the early data showing uh, kind of uh, two uh, regions of uh, continuum intensity. Um, uh, uh, later, these were those were powder samples. This is single crystal data showing some interesting momentum space structure uh, of those correlations. That looks, you know, if you have a mother's eye, maybe somewhat similar, uh, although certainly different from what you would get in Kataev's uh, model solution. Um, so, uh, you know, what is very clear is in all these systems, the ruthenium trichloride and uh, all these different honeycomb like iridates, the Kataev interaction, while it may be there, and it's probably there, and it's probably pretty significant, is not the only interaction in the system. Um, there'll be all sorts of other interactions uh, at the simplest level. For example, uh, Heisenberg exchange uh, is also present. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of work on uh, trying to understand the nature of these uh, additional interactions that I, I don't have time to go into here. Um, 
that I can point you in that direction if you're interested. Uh, some of the early studies uh, were just studies of this simple model where we consider both a Kataev and a Heisenberg interaction. You know, since the ground state only depends uh, 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 on the ratio uh, of these two parameters. So if we you know, multiply the Hamiltonian by a positive constant, we don't change its ground state. Um, so we can sort of plot this uh, on a, the ground states of this on a circle where um, the horizontal axis is J and the vertical axis is K. Um, so Kataev's exact solution actually applies for both signs of K, it doesn't really depend on the sign. So both, uh, the har both here and here you have Kataev spin liquid um, but uh, in, the, in the upper region, uh, this is actually where K has a ferromagnetic sign. Um, this uh, liquid state is actually very unstable to rather small values of J, stabilizing uh, two different types of magnetically ordered states. Uh, in the antiferromagnetic region, much more stable, um, but uh, other, types of, uh, other types of states uh, can occur. Um, and, uh, in fact, uh, in all these materials at zero magnetic field, uh, some type of ordering occurs. And in, in the two-dimensional ones, it's this zigzag type of order, which doubles the unit cell in some direction. Um, uh, so, so far, no quantum spin liquid state has actually been found, at least in zero magnetic field for these materials. Um, what, uh, what the main focus has, has turned to uh, uh, recently heavily in, in this subject is uh, trying to see whether the spin liquid might be somehow revived by application of a magnetic field. Uh, so I think uh, Quan Ong should have talked about this. Maybe this was the entire subject of his talk. I, I wasn't able to see it, um, uh, but many groups have been working on this. Uh, um, uh, so this is uh, you know, results uh, from uh, one experimental group combining uh, a number of, of different uh, measurements with the magnetic field applied uh, within the uh, two-dimensional plane of the honeycomb lattices in ruthenium trichloride. Uh, you have this kind of zigzag ordering occurring in zero field. This is field and this is temperature. Uh, as the field is increased at some actually relatively low field, the magnetism is destroyed. And above this field, there's no longer any magnetic order. Um, it turns out that the spins in, in such a field have a, only a pretty small polarization. Uh, it would take a field of uh, more like 50 tesla or something to, to largely orient the spins along the field direction. Uh, but uh, the magnetism itself is killed. And the speculation, the question is whether uh, just above the magnetically ordered state, there might actually still be a, a state that uh, is a quantum spin liquid in, in the sense of supporting fractionalized rotations and having uh, uh, having uh, having uh, a large uh, um, many body superposition in its ground state. Uh, here's an uh, example of a recent theoretical calculation. I think this is from He Young Ki's group in Toronto where they study one of these generalized models. Uh, they take the Kataev model, not plus a Heisenberg exchange, but plus uh, some uh, symmetric exchange anisotropy, sometimes called a gamma term. Uh, and they apply a magnetic field as well and they see uh, in a certain region of uh, applied magnetic field and gamma, uh, what they think is uh, a Skitayev, uh gapped quantum spin liquid state, um, the one with the chiral edge perhaps uh, persisting. Uh, but this is an extremely uh, active subject and by no means uh, is it actually resolved uh, whether a, a spin liquid state should occur there and for what model Hamiltonian. So, uh, Samit Sarkar has a question. Um, okay. The question is, why is the Kataev exchange uh, interaction dominates the Heisenberg exchange in this material? I guess they mean the alpha or sanium chlorium three. Uh, okay, so, I mean, it's a good question. Um, so, the simplest understanding perhaps goes back to the um, uh, to the super exchange calculation of Jekeli and Kululin, uh, who really considered um, you know, the super exchange between two uh, uh, transition metal ions, those are like the, the gray circles here, um, which are bridged by two oxygens. Um, and so there are two type of processes in which the, uh, uh, which allow this, uh, a d-electron spin here uh, to talk to a d-electron spin here. 
the usual one, which we normally we think of as being dominant in, in most transition metal oxides is a super exchange process where, um, uh, where there's a virtual exchange of electrons, but it occurs through an intervening oxygen. Uh, the interesting feature about uh, this, uh, these Kataev-like materials is that you have, as you have this, this is an edge of the octahedra that's shared between the two octahedra of these two transition metals. There's a quantum interference effect in such a oxygen mediated super exchange. We can super exchange along this path or along this path, along the top or the bottom path. And those paths can uh, actually interfere with one another in a way that um, uh, for this contribution, uh, there is no uh, symmetric Heisenberg exchange. However, there are other paths. Uh, so the, the idea would be that if this is the dominant contribution, it, it leads to no Heisenberg exchange. It would only give Kataev exchange. Um, However, there are other contributions. For example, there can be some direct overlap of the d orbitals of this transition metal and this one, and that could give Heisenberg exchange. Um, so that's the kind of picture. All right, um, but I would say you know uh, uh, the the jury is actually rather out, and it's I'd say fairly contentious the relative values of these things, although. There are many, many now ab initio calculations of these which don't all agree with one another, but they largely agree that the Kataev exchange is, is uh, probably the largest exchange coupling uh, in these systems. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna assume that that answered that question and uh, try and move on, but um, that's a good question. Uh, so, um, the intense focus on this possible field-induced spin liquid state uh, has a lot to do with uh, this experiment that was pu published a couple of years ago in Nature from Yuji Matsuda's group in Japan. Uh, they attempted to measure the thermal Hall effect. Um, I think uh, Kwan must have talked about this and what they found, uh, they observed uh, uh, thermal Hall conductivity, so um, a temperature difference normal to the heat current uh, in uh, intermediate range of field, which uh, plateaued and, and that this plateau value uh, seemed to correspond to the expected quantized value. That's the dashed line here um, uh, that's expected from uh, this universal conformal field theory result um, uh, for a number of different uh, uh, field configurations and samples, uh, they observed this. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, as Juan probably talked about, um, this uh, effect has not been reproduced in other labs. I don't know, he has been working hard to try to observe it. I don't actually know what uh, was in his talk because it's not online yet and I wasn't able to watch it. So you're now the experts. Uh, um, but there, there are many reasons uh, to think that while this is fascinating, it's certainly not that easy to understand. Um, one of the, the main challenges to understanding it even theoretically, which is something that we worked on in the past, I won't talk about it too much here, is that uh, in these experiments, uh, it's very different from the theoretical picture I talked about where all the heat is carried on the edge. In fact, we know that most of the heat in these samples is carried in the bulk because kappa XX is about a thousand times bigger than kappa XY, uh, even in the best case. Uh, so that, uh, Quantized thermal Hall effect is a, you know, at least a theoretically understood smoking gun signature of this one particular uh, non-abelian topological spin liquid state. Um, I want to move now to talk about a, a different uh, experimental platform, which are uh, quantum spin ice pyrochlors, where we have a, another possible smoking gun signature that, that's again known theoretically, at least. Uh, so this uh, this class of materials. Uh, uh, was studied uh, before quantum spin liquids uh, were uh, were investigated there uh, for their classical uh, properties as a kind of uh, beautiful system to study classical statistical mechanics. Um, uh, in particular, the materials holmium titanate and dysprosium titanate. Uh, these uh, they have this chemical structure. The the first rare uh, atom in this structure is is a, a rare earth holmium or dysprosium. They sit on the sites of a pyrochlor lattice like this. That's a lattice of corner sharing tetrahedra. In these materials, these spins can be regarded as really classical Ising spins that point either in or out of the tetrahedra. Um, and they, they don't have any real quantum fluctuations. They're just governed by a, an Ising Hamiltonian. Um, it's, 
the Ising interaction uh, favors states in which uh, uh, the four spins on a single tetrahedra either point all uh, two in, two out, or two out, two in. Um, so that uh, that actually allows a, a, a lot of different uh, configurations of these spins uh, on the full three-dimensional pyrochlor lattice. Uh, these are called spin ices because there's some analogy um, to the position of, of protons and water ice um, that I don't want to go into here. Um, because there's so many different possible ground states of these Ising interactions, uh, uh, even, uh, even when uh, all these uh, exchange interactions uh, of the Ising spins on these tetrahedra are satisfied, there's still a lot of spin configurations that uh, the system can fluctuate through. Uh, and so there's an interesting kind of classical liquid state in which the spins are highly correlated, but, but fluctuate heavily. Um, a nice feature of this is there's a, uh, uh, kind of beautiful uh, mapping of this space of low energy states in which uh, every tetrahedra has two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out um, to uh, uh, configurations of a, of a field with zero divergence. You could think about this as a magnetic field or an electric field if you want uh, with zero divergence. So the idea is very simple. We just uh, draw lines uh, uh, along the direction of these, uh, of these arrows. And because the number of arrows going in to any tetrahedra is the same as the number of arrows going out, uh, those lines will never stop. So they, they must either form uh, infinite extended lines or form closed loops. So we can think of these lines, therefore, as configurations of, uh, of fluxes that are conserved. And we know from electromagnetism, uh, for example, uh, the magnetic field lines, which according to Maxwell's equations, uh, have zero divergence, uh, describe field loops like this. Um, and there are interesting consequences of this. Uh, one of the most uh, beautiful ones, uh, which is I think pretty clearly observed experimentally uh, in, uh, which I remember if this is, I think this is dysprosium titanate um, in work by Tom Fen Fennell and collaborators from already more than 10 years ago now, um, is that uh, the spin correlations in the paramagnetic state of spin ice, so the spins are still fluctuating, but they have some interesting structure at, at uh, at low energies as a function of momentum, they display these kind of pinch points. So these are the points here, 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 here in a momentum space where the, the correlations have some singular structure. They're, they're strong if we approach this point along a radial direction and weak if we approach it along uh, uh, a tangential direction like this. And this, this is actually related to this divergence uh, constraint for these uh, sort of fictitious field lines. And there are many other properties that have been proposed. Uh, uh, an interesting feature is that, you know, if you were not at very low temperatures, there'll be occasionally defect tetrahedra, where uh, one of these dizing exchanges, for example, is violated. So that tetrahedra will, uh, doesn't have all the field lines passing through. They can end or start there. So that appears like a magnetic monopole. That's the language which is often used here. Um, and these defects uh, can be observed in various uh, types of experiments like uh, like magnetization relaxation. Um, so uh, quantum spin ice comes about if we uh, add quantum fluctuation to this classical spin ice. So the uh, uh, way you can imagine doing it is we, we start with a classical spin ice Hamiltonian, which is just an Ising model, and we add to it uh, terms which flip the spins. Uh, so you should think of, say, spin one and a half spins here, and now we add some, this is just an XY exchange, uh, uh, along nearest neighbor bonds. So this uh, term acting on one of these many degenerate Ising, uh, Ising states of classical spin ice will flip spins uh, and it can move the system around within the manifold of classical spin ice states. Uh, in that way, uh, the, the favored state quantum mechanically, you know, will be one that takes advantage of zero point motion and delocalizes across the, the many possible uh, ground states of this uh, spin ice system. Um, and in a way that I'll explain a little bit now, um, one can show that the ground state of this uh, quantum spin ice Hamiltonian under the right circumstances um, would actually be a, a superposition of class ice states. So that's a, you can think about the ground state, which is like the vacuum uh, of our many body system is a bit like the vacuum of electrodynamics in which there are, uh, you know, zero point uh, uh, fluctuations of the electric and magnetic field. You know, in the real world, those are things that, for example, give rise to Casimir forces uh, 
uh, between you know metal plates. Okay. Um, but this is not real uh, electrodynamics. It's just a spin liquid state that uh, mimics electrodynamics. Um, so going to a little bit, uh, I guess this is maybe more for the theorists, but to get an idea uh, how this comes about. Um, uh, so uh, this, at the simplest level, we can understand it from degenerate perturbation theory. Um, so uh, again, on every tetrahedron, we have four spins. Um, and what we, what we do in these spin ice materials is we identify a local z-axis with the axis uh, directed either in or out of the tetrahedra. So Sz for this spin is the spin polarization along this axis. Sz for this spin is the spin polarization along this axis. And the, the Ising part, the classical spin ice part of this Hamiltonian can be written like this. Um, we can write, uh, for every tetrahedra, the sum of the four spins, one, two, three, four, and square it, and then add this up over all tetrahedra with a positive coefficient. So this ensures that at low energies, uh, you know, if we optimize this term, the sum of the spins on every tetrahedra to be zero, and that means we have two spins uh, up and two spins down, or two spins in and two spins out. So the ground state of this Hamiltonian are the classical spin ice states, and they're very degenerate. And we add to this, uh, this quantum term, which flips spins. Um, uh, it does so along. Um, so here I've drawn uh, some subset of tetrahedra that are connected uh, in, in the pyrochlor lattice. So they form these uh, kind of hexagonal loops. Uh, and I've illustrated um, uh, one particular classical spin ice state, um, which as I mentioned has to have uh, two spins equal to plus one half, um, the Z components uh, on every tetrahedra and two equal to minus one half. So I'm, I'm drawing as blue, blue circles here, the spins which uh, are plus one half. So there are two on every tetrahedra you can check. Uh, so uh, this is a problem of degenerate perturbation theory. So this has a highly degenerate subspace. Those are the ground states should be built out of that. All the low energy states should be built out of that. And uh, this will uh, split those states. How does it work? Well, um, we should act uh, on a, in any one of those states with H1. Uh, that, for example, we act on this bond. What it does is it flips these two spins. It'll move uh, the, the uh, up spin that was here over here. So having done that, um, it didn't change the spin of this tetrahedra, but it, it changed the spin of this one and this one. So these two, you can see this only has one up, this has three. These two are no longer satisfying the ground state. They cost a, an energy of JZZ each. Okay. Um, so these two are thermally excited. We have gone out of the ground state manifold. Um, so in degenerate perturbation theory, uh, we have to act as many times as we, as we need to to get back to the ground state manifold. So we can act again uh, on another bond like this one, which will, if you go back, we, we had three spins here. Uh, I need to remove this up spin so I can do it by, oops, by acting on this bond that uh, uh, makes this tetrahedron again good, um, but we still have two bad ones, two excited ones, the original excited one here and now a new one uh, that, that we move this up spin to here. Uh, we can repeat this one more time, uh, a third time here on this third bond, uh, and that, that actually repairs the, the two uh, remaining bad tetrahedra. Um, so this is kind of a structure, part of the structure of the pyrochlor lattice that the smallest loops, non-trivial loops on this lattice are hexagons like this. That means that uh, within degenerate perturbation theory, the lowest order terms that can split the degeneracy actually occur at third order in, uh, in H1. Uh, so there's some effective Hamiltonian, which uh, requires three uh, actions of these uh, of this uh, quantum exchange. Uh, and that allows you to move around within this degenerate manifold. Okay. Um, so this term is a sort of what's called a ring exchange term. If you want to think in terms of the magnetic field lines, what this, what this ring exchange does, it moves around in this ground state manifold of classical spin ice, which has some description in terms of field lines it uh, cuts and reconnects the field line. So if we started out with a configuration like this uh, in the spin ice manifold, we would draw our field lines connecting like this. After the action of the, this ring term, the uh, field line that came in here now connects uh, to the left rather than to the right. Uh, so this is a, a purely spin manipulation. We, we arrive at some effective Hamiltonian that, that looks kind of complicated, but which uh, is, has the virtue that it, it lives within this low energy subspace. 
Uh, next, to analyze that, uh, we carry out this mapping to, uh, to take advantage of the idea of representing these field lines, uh, these spins as field lines. So uh, a way you can do this is every spin on the pyrochlor lattice lives at a corner of a tetrahedra, and that's shared by two tetrahedra. Uh, so we can write the z component of the spin, remember that's the projection along this axis, um, uh, as an electric field uh, along the bond connecting the two centers of these uh, tetrahedra. Um, uh, then the transverse components of the spin uh, are represented as an exponential of a of a vector potential, which is a conjugate variable to E. So this makes this S plus minus a raising and lowering operator for SZ, which is what it should do. Um, if you plug these, these two into the, the Hamiltonian, uh, this complicated looking ring exchange term becomes something simpler. It's just the cosine of the lattice uh, curl uh, on uh, all the, on the particular hexagon uh, of the lattice we're looking at. Um, and I've added to this uh, an additional term, uh, uh, which is just here to uh, enforce the constraint that actually EAB here is a, is a projection of a spin one half spin, so it should take values plus or minus a half. Um, so this is now something that looks rather familiar. It certainly would if you were a lattice gauge theorist. This is an example of a lattice uh, U1 gauge theory. Um, it's a particular example. It has two features. One, one is it's, uh, it's a little different from the ones that are, would be studied in a, a, a simple, uh, the simplest context, a simple review article, for example. Um, it's a, what we'd call an odd lattice gauge theory, and that, that means that the electric field here has half integer values rather than integer values. Um, in particular, there's no allowed zero value, which uh, allows a system to become trivial if it wants. And it's compact because this uh, vector potential here is actually a phase. It appears in the exponential. It's a, it's a two pi periodic variable. And that again reflects the fact that the spins are discrete. Um, uh, so um, we as a community know a lot about uh, relatively simple lattice gauge theories like this. Um, based on decades of experience, uh, originally coming out of particle physics, but also from statistical mechanics, a lot of numerical studies. What we know is that actually this particular Hamiltonian is well approximated in a, by a very simple approximation, at least for its low energy properties, which is that just that um, uh, by uh, expanding it to quadratic order in the fields. So if you expand the cosine, it gives a constant plus a quadratic term. And the quadratic approximation of this Hamiltonian becomes something very, very simple. It's a quadratic Hamiltonian, and it's, a, it's really a sum of electric field squared plus magnetic field squared. So that's exactly the Hamiltonian representation of electromagnetism. Um, so once we reach that point, we can really apply textbook electromagnetism, quantization of the electromagnetic field in terms of creation annihilation operators, and understand all the quantum properties of, of that system. Um, uh, so what do we know about quantum electromagnetism? We know that it has two types of particles. It has charges. Um, because it's a compact gauge theory, it can have both electric and magnetic charges. Usual electromagnetism in our real world, we only encounter electric charges, although you know, people have searched for decades for magnetic monopoles. And since Dirac's time, it's been postulated they might exist. Uh, in this artificial electromagnetism, we know they exist. So they're both electric and magnetic charges, but also like in the real world, that uh, quadratic Hamiltonian supports a photon. It's not a physical photon, but it's an artificial photon. And it's a, it's a gapless protective mode, uh, collective mode, um, which is uh, unusual in condensed matter that you have a gapless collective mode, um, which is not a Goldstone mode. Um, so this uh, gapless collective mode is the smoking gun signature uh, to be looked for in quantum spin ice. Um, what one can show is that it appears actually just in the spin correlations uh, of, uh, of the original uh, spins of the quantum spin ice system. In particular, the dynamical correlations of the Z components of the spins uh, should show a, a delta function, uh, you know, a resolution limited peak uh, at the energy of this artificial photon, which at low energies is linear uh, in the momentum. Uh, feature, that, that's a feature which is, would be true actually for a Goldstone mode. Um, what's different 
from a Goldstone mode, like an ordinary spin wave or magnon in an ordered magnet, is that the intensity of this mode, uh, rather than diverging as you approach the ordering wave vector, actually vanishes. Um, uh, the other uh, uh, important feature of this uh, photon mode is it's, it's not uh, gapless because of symmetry. So if you have a, a Goldstone mode in a, in a magnetic system, uh, it's gapless really because of a broken continuous symmetry. Uh, inevitably, in, in real uh, materials, there are no exact continuous symmetries. There's always some magnetic anisotropy that will reduce those continuous symmetries and open a small anisotropy gap. Uh, you can also apply perturbations like applied magnetic fields, et cetera, that reduce the symmetry of the system and will open up a gap. Uh, the photon is not gapless because of a symmetry. It's gapless uh, for topological reasons. Um, and uh, consequently, it, it, no small perturbation can open a gap uh, in there. Um, so this is another potential smoking gun signature. It really could be observed directly in a neutron scattering measurement, maybe in other measurements. Uh, but it hasn't, um, and in part, uh, the reason it hasn't is because the bandwidth of this photon, so the velocity, if you like, uh, is predicted to be very low. Um, and in particular, it's extremely low in, in the in most of the existing compounds that have been studied because these are rare earth materials where the exchange energy uh, is already only of order uh, a Kelvin or so. Um, so uh, there's a lot of effort to try to identify uh, uh, physical materials that uh, might uh, actually have this quantum spin liquid phase in it. Uh, physical materials don't generally have this simple XXZ Hamiltonian. They have other interactions. Um, several materials have been studied and uh, many people think that this uh, Prasodymium zirconate is a reasonable, uh, uh, is one of the best candidates that, that might be in this quantum spin liquid phase. Um, uh, uh, some of the more recent experiments uh, have been trying to identify um, this spin liquid state by the photon mode, uh, although they haven't observed it uh, spectroscopically, they try to observe some thermodynamic signature of it. Um, if you think about the thermodynamics, uh, they're sort of in, in classical spin ice, you have uh, basically just one energy scale, uh, the energy scale of the Ising interaction, that separates states which have defect tetrahedra, usually called monopoles, from the ground, ground state manifold of degenerate states. When we turn on the quantum fluctuations, all these degenerate states split up into kind of a, a range of energies. Um, and uh, we should expect that there's a sort of double peak structure in the specific heat, where the specific heat uh, has a, uh, you lose some of the entropy as we go through this sort of monopole energy scale, and the rest of the entropy at very low temperature as the photon loses most of its entropy. Uh, so specific heat would it be expected to look something like this. Here is a thermal conductivity measurement from Takiwa uh, and collaborators. Um, they measure thermal conductivity rather than specific heat because again, low temperature specific heat is very difficult to obtain, in this case due to nuclear contributions. The hope is the thermal conductivity uh, kind of mimics that. And they did see some feature here, uh, whether this is really evidence uh, for quantum spin liquid physics is not, uh, I would say, not clear to me at this point. Um, so, okay. Chen Li Wang is, uh, is asking, um, in the gauge field um, theory language, do we recover classical spin ice by letting the magnetic field to zero? In this limit, does the E field become diffusive? Uh, okay, we do recover classical spin ice. Um, basically by letting the, like the coefficient of the magnetic field go to zero um, and taking the temperature non-zero. Um, uh, what the second part of the question was, is uh, something diffusive? Uh, the electric field. Is the electric field diffusive? Um, it has some incoherent dynamics. Um, those have been heavily studied in classical spin ice community. I think it, it will have some dynamics like that, um, basically governed by uh, uh, some largely overdamped dynamics just subject to some conservation laws. Uh, um, honestly, I'm not sure exactly what it means for electric field to be diffusive, but we certainly expect generally um, uh, kind of relaxational dynamics in the uh, to happen in 
uh, you know, at long enough time scales, uh, the only conserved quantity in these uh, spin ice systems really is energy. Um, uh, so uh, there's no conserved magnetization, for example. Um, so um, you don't really have diffusion of magnetization. You would have diffusion of energy. Um, it becomes a question of temperature. Um, uh, so the, the kind of thing that's been studied heavily is, uh, do you have diffusion of monopoles? Um, so the defect tetrahedra, and that's believed to occur. Okay. Um. And uh, well, speaking of monopoles, Koval Volkov has a question about that. Um, can bound okay. states of monopoles, anti-monopoles uh, form due to the photon exchange in a quantum spin ice? Could such ex excitons be more robust signature, be a more robust signature uh, than specific heat? Um, okay, they certainly can form. Uh, that's uh, certainly nothing prohibiting that. Um, you know, it's a three-dimensional system, so formation of uh, bound states is, uh, is a little trickier um, than in lower dimensions where bound states always form. Um, we would expect some binding of charges because they, they follow a Coulomb law. Um, whether that's a more robust signature, uh, you know, details of bound states, how strong the binding energy is, et cetera, that depends on a lot of details, uh, what the effective mass is, et cetera, um, uh, what the effective dielectric constant is. So a little hard for me to say, I would expect that would be a more robust signature. It's much less universal than the, um, than the low temperature behavior of specific heat, which you know ultimately would be dominated by the photon and have a T cubed contribution, uh, for example. Um, but it might be an easier to observe signature in the sense that it's occurring at a higher energy scale. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, these are great questions. Uh, um, you know, they're uh, maybe you should work on it. <laughs> uh, that's a, not too much of a cop out of an answer, but uh, um, Thank you. I would say the community is still trying to find uh, what the best signature is. Uh, I mean, uh, this photon itself in the spectroscopic measurement is clearly the, the smoking gun here, but there may be other um, uh, uh, other signatures that would be uh, more easily accessible, not as as tied to low temperatures, for example. Um, let's see. Okay, need to. Um, all right, so the last uh, example of experimental systems I want to talk about are the uh, organics. Um, uh, there are two main uh, uh, organic materials uh, whose names I have no hope of pronouncing that have been studied in the spin liquid context. There's Kappa ET uh, and the uh, DMIT. Uh, these are these are uh, organic salts. They have they're both of them are. Um, have kind of basic structural units, which are dimers of uh, you know, rather large organic molecules. Um, the, they're members of, of, both of them are members of big families of these organics where uh, the molecules can be functionalized in various ways. You can add different end groups to the molecules. You can also have different molecules in between uh, that, that form the three-dimensional structural lattice. Uh, in both cases, uh, these dimers, uh, form a kind of distorted triangular arrangement, an anisotropic triangular arrangement within uh, planes of these molecules. Uh, the planes themselves are rather weakly coupled to one another in three dimensions. Uh, and it's believed, uh, which is really proven in many other uh, examples of these organic compounds, um, you know, with different, uh, different modifications of the molecule, uh, that each of these dimers can be uh, kind of thought of as a single, uh, a single degree of freedom with a small number of uh, internal levels. Um, in, uh, in, these, uh, in these two and, and many other of these uh, materials, these dimers form mod insulators in which there's a, a single unpaired spin uh, on each of these dimers. And so we can think of these uh, systems as uh, sort of triangular lattices of uh, single electron spins. Um, they're anisotropic. They don't have quite the same hopping uh, in a Hubbard model-like description uh, along this direction as these two directions. Um, uh, or in a magnetic uh, description, they'd be a little bit anisotropic. 
uh, but um, it's, it's believed that these particular two members are uh, sort of relatively close to the isotropic point. Um, what we know from uh, magnetic measurements is that these, uh, they behave as uh, roughly uh, a triangular lattice system of spin one half spins with an effective exchange energy of something like 200, 250 Kelvin um, between the spin one half spins. Um, because they're organic materials with very low molecular weight, uh, uh, low atomic weight atoms, uh, they're, uh, they're have very, very weak spin orbit coupling. So these are very isotropic magnetically. Um, they're also uh, rather close to metal insulator transitions. These can be driven into conducting states under very small pressure. Uh, so we think that they're probably better described by a Hubbard-like model than uh, an entirely localized spin model. Um, so these are examples of, uh, of uh, this is how the uh, cap T salt behaves under pressure. Uh, these are examples of the DMIT salt uh, varying uh, different uh, sort of end groups for this ET molecule. Um, you can see it can be driven, the ET, for example, can be driven between an antiferromagnetic long range ordered state and some charge ordered state. Um, and in between, they observe this quantum spin liquid state. Um, so you have. Uh, here, Sorry, I forgot. Question? You have five more minutes. Five more minutes. Yeah, OK. I, I kind of have my eye on the time. Um, so uh, what's notable about these particular two organics is they can, even though they have a relatively large exchange scale of a you know, couple hundred Kelvin, they can be cooled down to millikelvin temperatures uh, without any magnetic ordering. The main tool really for studying these systems, the uh, most convincing tool has been NMR. Um, and you can really see uh, 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 in NMR, it's a very sensitive tool for studying the appearance of local magnetic fields, static magnetic fields, which would arise if spins order. Uh, uh, and uh, that would lead to splittings in the, uh, in the line shape, uh, NMR line shape of, uh, of the nuclei here. So um, here you can see an example in one of the antiferromagnetically ordering ET salts um, at temperatures above the NAL temperature, you have a kind of a single line shape here that it tells you that all the nuclei are seeing the same magnetic field environment. As you cool it down below the nail temperature, this line splits into several peaks and that's reflecting different nuclei with different, uh, different local spin environments. On the other hand, in the spin liquid material, there's just no change in the line shape from uh, you know, relatively high temperatures down to millikelvin temperatures. Now, similarly, the DMIT material also, you can cool from 270 Kelvin down to 1.3 Kelvin, down to 20 millikelvin, and still not see any splitting of the line shape. Um, uh, uh, an intriguing feature of these materials is that they have a, a large linear specific heat at low temperatures. So this is uh, C over T versus T squared. Uh, so you can see this is a straight line with a non-zero intercept. That means it has a linear term, which is determined by the intercept, and a cubic term. So that the cubic term is an what we associated with the, with the phonon contribution, uh, which is very large in these materials. And the linear intercept is something strange. Um, uh, it's presumed to come from the spins and it indicates a, a very large uh, electronic or spin contribution of the specific heat. Um, and you can see it's only present for the spin liquid materials. Uh, here's two of the DMIT salts, a non-spin liquid salt has a zero intercept rather than uh, as opposed to the spin liquid one. Um, so, uh, you know, this T linear specific heat is something familiar. It's the Sommerfeld law that we associate with metals. So it somehow suggests that the specific heat in these compounds is behaving like that of a metal. Um, the general picture is that indeed, if we think about these uh, organics as being somehow in this Hubbard model phase space, here's the strength of uh, correlations and here's frustration, you know, somehow somewhere between the antiferromagnetic insulator and the metal. And so it's a bit closer to a metal behaves like a, a metallic insulator in some uh, you know, uh, paradoxical sense. So the uh, probably predominant theory of these states uh, uh, goes back to work of Motrinich and uh, Patrick and Sungsik Lee, uh, who proposed that this is an example of what's sometimes called the uniform RVB or a, a spin on Fermi surface state. Uh, in this Goodsfeeler picture, we, we, we just take the, take a, uh, unpolarized Fermi sea of electrons with both up and down spins filling a Fermi surface and Goodsfeeler project that to get an insulating state. 
Um, so given the time, I won't go into this too much, but the, the basic idea is that this, uh, uh, that ground state describes a, a sort of metal of spinless, uh, spinless fermions. So, um, you know, if you're a proponent of this, like Patrick Glee, uh, you see spin on Fermi surfaces everywhere. So this is some, somehow the most uh, proposed spin liquid state probably for any uh, among all spin liquid materials. Um, what has been sort of the linchpin of the case for this state um, in, uh, in the organics is experiment by uh, Yamashita et al. Uh, 10 years ago, where they measured, in addition to the specific heat, they measured the diagonal uh, thermal conductivity and saw that like the specific heat, so this is their data, um, it has a, a linear term. So this is plotted just like the specific heat. The intercept here is indicative of a linear in temperature specific uh, thermal conductivity, which is indeed what you'd expect in a metallic state. It's as though the interpretation is, it's as though these neutral spin-ons are behaving like a metal and carrying heat current. Um, so that has been uh, pulled out again and again by theorists and experimentalists as evidence for this spin-on Fermi state, surface state uh, in the organics. Um, uh, but uh, nine years later, uh, last year, uh, we saw appearance of a, a number of experimental studies that uh, disagree with this, um, really at the level of the data. Um, and uh, all these studies, so these are studies from two different groups, uh, uh, find a thermal conductivity with a zero linear term in it. Um, and uh, uh, the conclusion of these studies is that the thermal conductivity is actually predominantly coming from phonons, not, not spins or electrons. Um, and there's really uh, quantitative differences between the data uh, from these groups and, and that of the, the earlier data. And so there's some controversy here. Um, the earlier measurements, this is, these two are plots sort of comparing the earlier data uh, which are the upper curves here to the to the new data, um, and you know, the main feature I want you to to see here is that the earlier experiments just show a much larger thermal conductivity period um, uh, uh, than is observed in any uh, of the recent attempts to reproduce uh, the data. Um, so there's an ongoing dialogue uh, between different groups on this, um, uh, and uh, I think this is just still unresolved. Um, so I'm going to wrap up. I just uh, I've been trying to give you some introduction to the way uh, uh, way we might think about quantum spin liquid systems and what some of the uh, the current experimental status is. Um, I've only really scratched this. There are many many more materials being studied. Lots of uh, very interesting potential quantum spin liquids out there. Um, uh, and uh, I'll kind of leave this. I think with a, just a quick mention of some of the frontiers. Um, you know, on the theoretical side, uh, uh, there are interesting new ideas for new types of quantum spin liquid phases. Um, there's a lot of interest in uh, a new variety of topological phase, something called fracton phases. Um, and in quantum spin liquids, uh, there's some interesting ideas about how these spin liquid states might be uh, generated by a quench disorder uh, or favored by them. Um, uh, how to think about these quench disorder uh, induced spin liquids is an interesting problem. There are still fundamental questions in the theory of spin liquids. Um, uh, things like the spin on Fermi surface state are really uh, kind of interesting quantum many body problems of strongly coupled matter and gauge fields. Um, we don't understand in general the quantum critical points to and from quantum spin liquid phases. Um, as experimentalists, uh, improve their tools for studying out of equilibrium quantum systems. Uh, we would like to understand uh, what are the equilibrium responses of quantum spin liquids. Um, and finally, there's a sort of old uh, idea, which is really uh, was one of Anderson's earliest for introducing us, is that a doping a quantum spin liquid induced superconductivity. Um, I think the field, the theorists are sort of now just starting to be ready to, uh, to really try to address a more quantitative way um, in model systems. But for me, that the main front is, is still in connecting quantum spin liquids to reality. Uh, there are a lot of new materials. Um, hopefully one of them will be the sweet one where we can both find a smoking gun signature and, and measure it uh, without any controversy. 
Um, maybe we'll manage to do this in very different systems, not necessarily the bulk materials where people have been looking for them before, maybe in, in these new Van der Waals two-dimensional systems, for example. Um, a lot of new work on different types of experiments that we don't understand that well theoretically, thermal Hall effect, uh, nonlinear spectroscopy. Um, and there are huge computational advances in, uh, in improving our methods for dealing with the kind of quantum antibody problems that, uh, that you need to confront in, in uh, understanding quantum spin liquids. So uh, there's a lot of uh, room for uh, problem in the near future. So I'll stop here. Thanks. Well, thanks, Professor Valenz, uh, for this amazing overview of this field. We have still questions, um, some questions left. So first I'll talk, I ask the questions about the organics part of your talk. Um, uh, so Joshua Heath is asking, what is the nature of the uh, Fermi surface instabilities in the spin on uh, Fermi surface of the organics or the Majorana Fermi surface in uh, lithium to um, iridate? Um, and it has a second part. So if you want to. Answer okay, well, let me start with the first part. Um, so uh, the spin on Fermi surface state um, is, uh, you know, is a, as close to a, just to put it in context, the spin on Fermi surface state should be thought of as sort of as close to a metal as you could get in an insulator. And there's the potential sorts of metal physics, you know, when, whenever we have a, a very clean metallic system, uh, there are lots of uh, modes for, uh, there's lots of low energy states near the Fermi surface. That's what's special about a, about a metal. A Fermi surface uh, has a huge number of low energy states. And so by making sort of small changes to the low energy spectrum, we can uh, get to all sorts of other many body states. So these are sort of familiar instability metals, spin density waves, charge density waves, superconductivity, um, uh, maybe more exotic uh, uh, instabilities, a D density wave, for example, type of things that have been looked for in, in many body systems like the Cooper's. Um, so uh, such things might be expected in the spin on Fermi surface state. Um, it's uh, not entirely clear, actually, theoretically, whether the spin on Fermi surface state is stable, for example, to pairing. Uh, we can talk about pairing the, uh, the fermions in the spin on Fermi surface. It, that's uh, you know analogous to superconduct metal, um, but of course it's not a superconductor because the fermions are neutral. Um, but many people have suggested that uh, there have been ideas of exotic pairing states in which you don't pair fermions with opposite momentum, something called Amperian pairing. Um, there are also uh, states in which the fermions pair like in a BCS superconductor with uh, equal and opposite momentum. That actually is a way to convert spin on Fermi surface state to a topological spin liquid. Um, we can so imagine the charge and spin density waves, which would break uh, spatial series uh, or maybe symmetry, but still potentially preserve the some part of the Fermi surface. Uh, lots of things have been contemplated. I don't think there's a very uh, clear theoretical answer. Um, in the organics, uh, there is various evidence at low temperature, temperatures of around four or five Kelvin uh, for some types of transitions. Um, exactly what the nature of those transitions are to me is not entirely clear and whether it should be thought about as a Fermi surface instability or not is, is certainly unclear. Um, but uh, that is one of the lines of thinking there. Um, the second question was about Majorana Fermi surfaces and lithium iridate. I mean, uh, my zeroth order statement would be lithium iridate orders uh, magnetically. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence for a, really for Majorana fermions in any way in lithium iridate, but uh, you could correct me if you think there's some compelling evidence. Uh, that's a um, more complicated. Uh, I think your, I think the question was about three-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional hyper honeycomb lithium iridate. Um, there's several three-dimensional uh, versions of that um, that have actually been more studied than the two-dimensional one. Um, uh, I, I think there's a lot less information there. Uh, I don't understand it, so I can't answer that question so well. This, I guess. So the second part um, is uh, going to follow up. Um, there, uh, Josh is asking, um, are these spin-ons more stable to um, 
Pomeranchuk. I don't know how to read that. Pomeranchuk. Um, yes. Uh, type instabilities, uh, then a conventional. That's another type of instability I didn't mention. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so, you know, the, uh, all these, you know, even an ordinary Fermi surface is sort of marginally stable. Um, that's the, you know, what's been known since dating back to Landau and refined in various ways. The ordinary Fermi surface, like in a Fermi liquid, is kind of a marginally stable state. That's why, for example, superconductivity can occur with arbitrarily weak attractive interactions. So, but, you know, normally we don't see, most metals don't turn into charge density waves because they don't have an attractive interaction in the right channel, um, or that occurs at very low temperature. Um, Pomerantic instabilities are a little bit different. They require a, a, a certain minimal strength of interaction to occur. That's a, just for those who don't know, a Pomerantic instability is something associated with a change in the shape of the Fermi surface, a lowering of symmetry, like the Fermi surface distorts from having circular symmetry to being an ellipse, uh, which could distort in this direction or it could distort in this direction. And that's associated with a instability driven by one of the Landau interaction parameters. Um, so those interaction parameters, one of the things about a spin-on Fermi surface state is that those Landau interaction parameters should be large because the underlying uh, fermions are emergent. They have very strong interactions between them. So it's certainly very plausible. Usually in actual experimental systems, Pomeranchuk type instabilities occur near some Fermi surface topology change. Uh, the, there are not so many examples, but where they're known to occur are, are places like that, where there's a you're near a Van Hove singularity of the Fermi surface. Um, so uh, at this point, you know, finding a spin liquid which has a spin on Fermi surface and tuning it near a Van Hove singularity is a lot to ask. We'd be happy to just find one. So um, uh, I think maybe that's a, a, a more specialized root of, of phenomena to look for. Okay. Um, so before I get to the rest of the questions, um, I have one question about other material platforms that you briefly mentioned at the end of our talk. Um, mm -hmm. So in um, Alan McDonald's paper back in 2018, they talked about these TMD heterobite layers that were like with a specific twist angle, you could get to a phase where the exchange couplings could lie within a spin liquid phase. Um, mm -hmm. Given that these systems are very like more experiment experiment friendly since they're semiconductors and not like insulators, like a lot of spin liquid materials. What are your yeah. um, thoughts on this? Like how much promise do you see in these platforms? Oh, I see a lot of promise. I think at this point, um, they're, you know, what's great about them is indeed, you know, most of them are conducting at some level. Uh, and so that means you have a, a, a fleet of experimental tools that you can apply that measure currents and, and electric fields, right, at some level. Um, the, um, they're also very flexible because they're very tunable. The, the flip side is they're also, you know, the, what makes them uh, able to show correlation physics despite the materials themselves being basically semiconductors is that they are they are tuned carefully into a regime where they're very very sensitive they're extremely low density systems and they're very sensitive to small changes in twist angle to uh, uh, and to other things like strain um, what the nature of the neighboring layers are, et cetera. What that means is that in practice, we have not as much predictability, um, theoretically. Um, you know, I think, you know, for example, an example I like to point to is uh, in experiment, uh, a number of groups have observed the quantum anomalous Hall effect in, uh, in twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, uh, but it, it's, by far the strongest at filling uh, nu equals three out of four. And it doesn't occur at, in the same samples, doesn't occur at nu equals minus three and doesn't occur at nu equals plus minus one. Um, now, why? Um, that's a very, sounds like a very simple thing. Uh, and I don't think there's an explanation for it. Um, uh, but it may depend on, on details that we don't understand and don't know how to model. 
um, so the, the flip side here is there, there, I think a lot of sensitivity to small effects, um, but uh, the, the good thing is there, there are a lot of new tools. Uh, I think, I do think it's very promising and interesting. That's one of the avenues I, I think that would be very exciting to explore. Um, challenge will be, of course, that uh, you're trying to measure, ultimately trying to measure something related to magnetism. Um, and you have to do that via the tools you have available to you. Um, and it, because they're very small, two-dimensional, not that many electrons in there, um, it's, it's not so easy to measure magnetism. People have tried to study, for example, a single monolayers of ruthenium trichloride, um, which is also a van der Waals material. And uh, so far, um, that's interesting, but not clear. So. Okay, um, so I guess, yeah, there are, there's a question about perhaps like the beginning of your talk um, about uh, ruthenium uh, chloride. So one of the recent, Pavel Volkov is asking, one of the recent developments in that compound is that a similar thermal hall effect uh, has been observed for in plane field, uh, which is mm -hmm. kappa XZ. Could you comment on the extensions of Katab model in 3D and its possible applications to ruthenium chloride? Uh, so what I understand has been observed actually um, is not kappa XZ, it's still kappa XY. We have to be careful what we mean by coordinates. Um, uh, so I think I think the question is, is uh, again, data from Matsuda's group. Uh, so they have a second paper. I don't know what the status is. Maybe it's published now. Um, uh, where they uh, they apply a field within the uh, within the honeycomb plane, um, uh, but for certain directions within the honeycomb plane, they still observe the quantized kappa x y. So that so the um, it's still kappa x y in the sense that the uh, the temperature gradient and the thermal current are both within the x y plane. They're they're just not one of them is not perpendicular to the uh, to the applied field. Okay. Um, so, uh, that's possible because it's not free space. The lattice has lots of anisotropies in it. It's, um, in fact, that's what is predicted from Kataev's model. Um, uh, I'm not sure I understood what the question was beyond that. So th that has an explanation within Kataev's model. Um, uh, is it, you know, again, that's another observation that has not been reproduced from others. Okay, um, so um, side is the experimentalist knew about. I, I'm sure knew that it was predicted within Kataev's model. So always better if experimentalists discover something and doesn't know that it was expected. Yeah. Um, another question about um, when you were explaining the gauge theory, application of gauge theory in uh, spin liquid systems. Uh, so Christian Chong is asking, why does the textbook e ENM approach work for the odd gauge theory? Um, um, yeah, okay. Um, maybe I should go try to go back to that slide. Uh, just somewhere here. Uh, let's take this one. Sorry. All these little zoom bars block everything. There we go. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, you know, this is the Hamiltonian of this gauge theory. Um, and uh, so generally, uh, so the sort of textbook gauge theory would be the one where E takes integer values rather than half integer values. And, and then it's, it's rather simple to understand what happens in this Hamiltonian. If, if U is very big, uh, then it simply wants to minimize this term by setting E equals zero everywhere. Um, and uh, in that case, the K term is unimportant. And that's a unique state that's just e equals zero. There's no superposition in there. It's a very simple thing. Um, so that's a not the Coulomb phase. That's called the confined phase or gapped phase. Um, the Coulomb phase occurs when K is much bigger than U, then we want to minimize the cosine. And so we should expand it around its minimum like here. Okay. Um, 
The odd gauge theory is a trickier because since the E is half integer, even when U is large, there's a degeneracy of the, the low energy electric field states. Um, so that's what's special about the odd gauge theory that um, even if U is large, which is actually what it should be, um, uh, this, this term doesn't really constrain the ground state that much. Um, and so uh, it's not so obvious what happens in that limit. And that's really based uh, largely on numerical studies that we know uh, that this is actually in the, what's called the Coulomb phase, uh, that it's well described by this uh, expansion still, um, even, even when U is large. Okay. Um, question perhaps related to this section again. Um, Aniruddha Menon is asking, is there an interpretation of electromagnetism where the K is hexagon dependent, i.e. that is a QED Hamiltonian? If so, what's a good reference on the subject, if any? Uh, so, sorry, the question is if K is hexagon dependent? Um, yes, yeah, I guess they mean... to exactly the question. So, it, I mean, in principle, there's no there's no obstacle to doing this if k is hexagon dependent and um you know if we added a little bit of randomness maybe he's thinking about randomness where this k would depend on the uh, on which hexagon we're looking at um that's something that's been studied a little bit i mean i could there's a paper i wrote with lucille savary a few years ago about disorder and spin liquids maybe relevant to that um, and probably more recent papers referencing that um uh, so one of the you know nice features about a photon is it still propagates in an inhomogeneous medium. If you if you have an inhomogeneous medium, the photon will propagate through it. Uh, it might diffuse a little bit, but the longer and longer wavelengths just uh, kind of average over that inhomogeneity. Um, so that that is something familiar to us from from ordinary you know optical media. Um, having an inhomogeneous K here is like that. It's K is related to the local magnetic permittivity uh, of the medium. That's what it would be in, in electromagnetism. So indeed we could have a, we could have a spatially varying U and a spatially varying K and it wouldn't do that much for the photon at low energy. No. Thank you. Um, so probably the last question of the talk since we're out of time, um, Anna Maria, um, asks, could spin liquid phases um, exist between two itinerant magnetic phases? Uh, can we uh, see the lack of ordering due to competition of itinerant magnetic fluctuations? Uh, the way the question was phrased, I think I would say, sure, why not? Um, sounds possible. Uh, I don't know that I would have any detailed theoretical uh, picture of it. I mean, there definitely is an interest in and some work in, in pursuing spin liquid physics in itinerant systems. There's a, a connection um, of spin liquids to uh, heavy fermion systems, which are, you know, have both local moments and conduction electrons and where there seem to be states in which uh, not all the electrons participate in the Fermi surface. That might be viewed as a um, as an example where the some of the some of the electrons form a spin liquid and the rest form a, a conductor. Um, that's actually one of the views that, that people have tried to use to understand some of the anomalous behaviors in heavy fermion systems, and that such a state might occur between states in which all the electrons participate or or they're all localized. Um, uh, so, so indeed, I mean, th these ideas are out there. Um, uh, you know, one of the nice things about, for a theorist, about insulating spin systems is that they, they're described by, their Hamiltonians are describable by a relatively small number of parameters. We know in an insulating system, only nearby spins talk to one another. And so typically we describe their interactions by a few exchange parameters. And that's enough kind of local parameters on, on near describing uh, interactions between nearby spins are, are enough to specify the Hamiltonian. Um, in an itinerant system, you know, the, the kind of information to describe the Hamiltonian uh, needs to describe the full Fermi surface. There's a lot of information to describe an itinerant system, typically, and the interactions between the quasi-particles. So it's, it's often less compact. It's more reliant on uh, numerical approaches like ab initio calculations, for example. Um, 
theorists are usually try to find their way to uh, to some simpler representation like type binding models or effective models of the conduction and valence bands. Um, but uh, it's something again, uh, which is on a case by case basis, I would say. Um, so that, that's part of the appeal to theorists of insulating magnetic systems. The, the bad side of it is what Galar already said is that you know you lose out on a on a huge host of experimental tools which are just fantastic and powerful for studying itinerant systems. So, um, yeah. Well, so that, I mean, if I were an experimentalist, I probably would want to study itinerant um, electrons and look for spin liquids there. Okay. Uh, the theorists were a little handicapped, but you know that should make you feel good. Probably you like to study systems that theorists can't explain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess uh, that'll be our uh, last question of the session. Well, thanks, Professor Valence, for joining the summer school and the amazing talks. Uh, thanks for having me.